Welcome to the Legion Strength and Conditioning Podcast. You can check us out at legionsc.com or follow us on Instagram at legion.sc. Today we're going to talk about uh, building capacity and muscle endurance and training. Um, and for a certain tier of athlete, muscle endurance ends up being uh, often the limiting factor in terms of performance, right? That people, um, especially in mixed modal tests, a lot like the open, that they end up having to stop, not necessarily because they're too tired and like a sense of being out of breath or um, unable to continue, but they end up running into um the inability to do more handstand pushups or more pull-ups or their quads start to blow up on wall balls or something like that. So for a lot of people, the limiting factor in terms of continuing to keep moving um, in conditioning workouts ends up being one specific muscle group, just kind of, you know, getting a pump or blowing up or whatever. Um, often shoulders, grip, quads, calves, low back. Uh, those are Those are typically what people feel. So now, we can't always trust what people feel as far as what the actual limiting factor is for them as far as um, performance and, and what's stopping them. But there's definitely an element of understanding how to progress muscle endurance and what the role is of muscle endurance in terms of um, limiting conditioning and how you can potentially train that. Uh, that that needs to be a, a, a pretty significant part of anyone's CrossFit program, right? Especially if they have a goal of doing well uh, in something like the Open or some sort of online qualifier. So, John, what what do we need? What do people need to be able to do uh, as far as muscle endurance in order to actually compete in the sport? So, I think if we if we take the 2019 Open as kind of a a guideline to that, um, you look at workout one. You know, 15 minutes of wall bars and rowing. It's for most people that's going to be a uh, a quad based workout. Um, but I think at the same time, you're going to see people who will burn out their shoulders because their legs Such get as myself. Yeah. The legs get tired after like three rounds. So they start overcompensating with the shoulders throwing in the med ball and, uh, then their shoulders start to burn out. Um, so, you know, looking at that workout quads and shoulders, um, and like I said, that's pro that's predominantly the muscle groups we're going to see burning out um, on the workout too with the toes to bar and squat cleans. Short toes to bar, people are going to fry their abs, um, especially if they're not uh, particularly efficient with their kip. Um, but again, for a lot of people burning out the quads, if they have the capacity to get through the toes to bar, um, their quads are going to be burning by the time they hit kind of round three, round four. Um, so... A lot of it comes down to squat-based movements and press-based movements. Um, even for something that's relatively high in pulling. So if you take, I guess, 19.5 is kind of equal pressing and pulling. Um, but not many people are fatiguing on the, the pulling aspect of a chest bar pull-up. Um, especially if they're a decent level athlete, they're going to be either breathing or their shoulders from the thrusters and uh, chest to bars combined. Um, so going back to what people need to be good at, um, really that high volume work from a squatting and a pressing standpoint um, for most CrossFit athletes are the things that need to be focused on to avoid burning out in a workout. So if we think about what the I guess what the requirements are, you know, we can think about different tiers of athletes, right? We can have people who want to, um, you know, participate in something like the open and be able to do all the workouts as prescribed. We can think of people who, um, want to do it as prescribed and sort of beat people locally within their gym, or maybe their friends in other cities or whatever. We have people who, um, want to improve relative to their performance in previous years. We have people who uh, want to do well in the open. Um, you know, maybe some people who are formerly uh, like regional level athletes or on the cusp of being regional level athletes who, you know, for their, their own satisfaction want to perform in like the 99th percentile or whatever, but have no actual chance of qualifying for anything. And we also have people that are trying to, to move on to the CrossFit games from the open, right? And that all those groups are going to have slightly different requirements as far as what they need to be able to do. Um, we can certainly think about what, um, 
what are the requirements of the test, right? Like how many repetitions do you need to be able to do in a specific uh, movement pattern in order to even complete the test um, as prescribed, right? So, you know, it's, it's, there's some easy math as far as um, how many wall balls do you need to be able to do in a workout uh, in order to perform at a certain level. And it's like, okay, well, if you want to beat people in your gym locally um, and you're a male who's, you know, has decent capacity, you probably need to be able to do about eight rounds on that workout. So um, how many wall balls is that? Well, it was 19 per round. So 152. 80, yeah, 152, right? So that's somewhere around the, the typical volume that you would expect of wall balls in a workout based upon a benchmark like Karen. Um, and you can say, okay, well, if you're trying to perform at a higher level, maybe you need to get somewhere in like the, the nine plus rounds range. Um, so you're going to add a little bit more volume on top of that. But, you know, the, the, the overall idea of this sort of quote unquote functional volume of training um, is something that, that everyone needs to be aware of, right? Um, how many wall balls are you going to be expected to do in a workout? How many chest bar pull ups are you going to be expected to do in a workout, right? If you're going all the way through something like 19.2 um, or 16.2, right? Okay, well, you're potentially doing five rounds of 25 uh, toes to bar, which is actually a lot, right? That's that's mm -hmm. quite a few toes to bar. Um, and that, that's generally a higher functional volume as far as uh, the number of repetitions that people are training than, than a lot of people are getting in on a weekly basis. So there's simply the, the ability to do the number of contractions in a specific workout that needs to be trained. Um, so that needs to be built up over time, meaning that, okay, if you're expected to do 125 toes to bar in a specific workout, what does that look like? Well, that looks like building up to doing 125 toes to bar um, per week over time, potentially double that if you're actually doing um, two attempts at a workout like that. Um, and then what does that look like building into doing that many toes to bar? Well, you're going to have to get a certain number of contractions of, um, you know, ab based hip flexion as well as, um, you know, kipping on a weekly basis. Um, so you can sort of think about, you know, building over time to actually doing that number of reps isn't just a matter of saying, okay, well, you know, let's count up the reps and, and make sure we're hitting it. It's a matter of making sure that you as an athlete actually have the base of support necessary to do those number of contractions. And that that's something that is potentially going to take uh, a pretty long time to build up to doing that number of toes to bar or chest to bar or wall balls or muscle ups or whatever. Um, in just, just in terms of like, can you even do those contractions? Right. Um, and I think that's a, that's a good point in terms of how to manage the the training of that because it's not just as straightforward as um, okay you need to do 125 toes to bar a week until they feel until they feel comfortable. Um, I think there's an element there where you need to know, I guess how to how to handle it within a single workout, um, and knowing where your form starts to break down or where your fatigue starts to kick in um, mid workout. Cause you know, someone might be able to do, um, let's say a hundred toes to bar one at a time and have no issues, but you start throwing in sets of five and then all of a sudden they, they can't do more than like four sets of five unbroken. Um, so I think there's an element there of how the, the reps are structured within a workout as well. Um, and it's not just a straight volume doesn't just equal volume if that makes sense yeah for sure it um, depends on the, on the context of it too right because a lot of this as well is under fatigue so it's not just can you do that number of repetitions but can yeah. you do that number of repetitions under various forms of fatigue yeah. right because it's one thing to accumulate 30 ring muscle ups as you know every minute on the minute for 10 minutes do three ring muscle ups um and it's another thing to accumulate 30 muscle or 30 ring muscle ups uh what was the what was the other workout after 150 wall balls and 90 double unders, right? Especially if right. you're trying to go fast on the wall balls and double unders, um, that you're you're potentially in a totally different scenario. And some people might be quite tolerant of volume uh, in a non fatigue state, but are unable to just again get the reps done once they are out of breath or tired or doing uh, like you mentioned before, you know, movements that are potentially uh, interfering with each other, right? You're doing yeah. thrusters um, and pull-ups, which, yeah, one is sort of a more pushing movement and the other is a more pulling movement. But a lot of that is going to involve similar contractions of the rotator cuff to even uh, move and stabilize the, the scapula to go overhead. So, right. you know, if you 
if you do tend to, to fatigue quickly um, in those scapular stabilizers, that can end up being a limiting factor as far as your ability to continue doing chest bar like you mentioned. Yeah. And I think that kind of crossover between movements, um, sometimes people underestimate that. Um, so one of my favorites to have people do combined is ring muscle ups and toes to bar. Um, cause when you're fresh, people don't realize how much core involvement there is in a ring muscle up. Um, yeah. and if you were to do, let's say a set of, um, let's say 20 toes to bar and then try and do a higher volume set of ring muscle ups, which obviously is going to be dependent on the athlete as to what higher volume is. Um, but they're going to really struggle to be honest with, uh, with being able to perform ring muscle ups in their usual kind of capacity and ability. Um, once you, once you add in that fatigue of the toes to bar and of the core, um, and there's a lot of movements that cross over that people don't immediately think about. I think in the open this year, the big one was the bar face and burpees into the bar muscle ups. Um, I don't think people expected to struggle to lock out bar muscle ups, but I saw a lot of people that who are great at bar muscle ups actually have issues locking out near the end of the workout because they were so fatigued from the burpees and pushing off the ground. Um, yeah, for sure. That was definitely a, I, I got that feedback from a lot of people mentioning either their, their, their pecs or their triceps as um, a limiting factor on that piece. Yeah. Um, which is definitely not what you'd expect. Um, expect from that workout. Um, when initially when I saw it, I was expecting it to be a grip fatigue workout, um, given the snatches and then strains to the bar muscle up similar to the open workout. Oh, that, the lighter power snatch one. Yeah. Yeah. I think I was maybe 15, 2015. Um, I don't remember what year it was, but yeah. But yeah, I was expecting it to be more in that domain where people were starting to fail on grip near the end more than anything. Um, right. But from what I saw, most people weren't affected too much by that. And it was more the pressing. Yeah, for sure. Um, but yeah, I think that if we, if we kind of take a step back and think about the, the training process, right. Um, again, we have these different avatars of people as far as what they want to be able to do, you know, do you, are you just at the level where you're trying to do uh, movements as prescribed? Um, and maybe you have some of them, but it's a challenge for you to do the number of repetitions, um, in, a, in, in an open event, or are you trying to, to perform at a relatively high level, right? And the, the requirements for muscle endurance between those groups are going to change. Um, but if we think about where does muscle endurance sit in the overall training plan, right? It's kind of a, it's kind of a complicated piece because people who are, um, let's say, uh, relative beginners or who are potentially struggling to do um, certain movements like ring muscle ups or handstand push ups or whatever may need to actually build up their base of support in muscle endurance in order to do the training to get movements, right? So if you have someone who isn't, uh, let's say, strong enough to do um, heavy squat cleans to make it through the first, um, the first uh, whatever cutoff point in a workout like 19.2, they may need to improve their overall squatting strength in order to be able to do that. But in order to improve their squatting strength, they may need to do muscle endurance work to do squat training, if that makes sense. Sure. The, the best path for them might not be, okay, well, let's put you on a squat program where you do, you know, wave loading back squats on a weekly basis. The best program for them may be doing a bunch of, um, you know, double dumbbell front squatting at high repetitions, dumbbell step ups, rear foot elevated split squats, um, and, uh, you know, high repetition tempo squatting to build up the muscle endurance to then move into a strength program, which then will actually give them the base of support to do the strength program properly, which then may give them enough absolute strength to then try to express it as muscle endurance in conditioning, which is kind of roundabout. Um, but I think relevant for um, things like muscle ups as well, where someone may need to do muscle endurance work in upper body pushing and pulling in order to properly do a muscle up program to develop right. the muscle up enough that it can then be in and of itself trained as a muscle endurance activity in a conditioning environment, right? So we can think about um, muscle endurance as a base of support, as well as muscle endurance as something that uh, uh, needs to be expressed under fatigue um, in conditioning. And that's not necessarily easy or intuitive for people to think about. Um, but I think that, as, you know, a sort of like backroom coach talk um, is something that needs to be uh, sort of top of mind for anyone trying to figure out, you know, where does someone actually need to spend their time in training? Right. 
Um, so I think then um, it's worth mentioning the, well, I would say the psychological aspect of muscle endurance. Um, I feel like a lot of the time there's a potential for people who don't necessarily have an issue, like a physiological issue with muscle fatigue, um, but they struggle to actually um, put it into practice when they're in a workout. Um, and maybe it's a, it's a psychological um, effect on physiological issues um, in the sense that maybe they kind of talk themselves out of it and their negative talk makes them feel more fatigued than they actually are. Um, but I think the people's mental capacity to handle volume, both in training and in competition is pretty, is pretty significant. Um, so you take someone who, uh, who really just struggles to mentally, um, like force themselves to do high volume work in training. Um, maybe you program someone like Karen, so 150 wall walls and, they go into it already thinking, well, this is going to suck. I'm not, a, I'm not good at this movement. I'm feeling a little tired today. My legs are a little sore already. Um, and people like that are going to struggle to improve their muscular endurance um, and their capacity within a movement, um, regardless of their physical ability. Yeah. And I think that the, uh, um, you know, the psychological component there isn't always just, uh, you know, a lack of effort or whatever, it's an element of how you respond to those fatigue signals, right? That I think some people are just more sensitive than others to that, let's call it just like burning feeling, right? That some people um, experience that burning and to them, it's just, it's just part of it. They're like, okay, cool, fine. My quads are on fire, but I can do another repetition and it's fine. And other people, um, you know, that, that, that fatigue signal just actually impairs their ability to do work much more uh, which then can potentially lead down that negative rabbit hole that you just mentioned, John, of being like, oh, well, I'm not good at this. So I need to be careful because as soon as it starts burning, I'm in trouble. Um, you know, and then you do have people for whom uh, that that tendency to to totally fall apart as soon as they hit a muscle endurance limiter is more pronounced. So then those individuals maybe do actually need to be more careful. So it's it's uh, it's kind of a complicated interplay back and forth between the, um, you know, actual physiological limitations as far as you know once you hit this point you your performance is going to drop off regardless of how much you will yourself to keep going versus um you know not talking yourself into uh you know negative negative images of yourself um relative to your ability which can which can then impact your performance because you're hypersensitive to fatigue signals and all that and i don't necessarily have a great uh uh, a great way of, of framing that for people other than just having a lot of experience and knowing where you sit on that and trying to learn all the time as far as what is, what is a true limiting factor for you and what is something that uh, um, can be pushed through. And then honestly, what's something that you may suck at and may struggle with, but that based upon how you approach it in training, uh, if you approach it with, we'll call it like a quote unquote good attitude, that you can actually improve it significantly, even though it may not be something that you're as talented at as uh as people who you who who you who you're competing with or just um you know where you want to be relative to to what your potential is yeah and yeah like i think you touched on there um the the fear of being bad at something can also affect the training of that um and it might be that you're you're bad at high volume whatever we're talking about um high volume deadlifts people suck at that yeah and let's say the, the fear of being bad at high volume deadlifts um, can mean you just never improve it because your training of the high volume deadlift um, is always um, subpar because you're, you're worried about it and you think it's going to go badly. Um, so by you worrying about it and not training it properly, it never does go that well. Um, and you never do manage to train it to be good. Um, it's kind of a a catch twenty two, I believe it would be referred to. It's uh, um, I'm I'm not sure if that's is, is that an actual catch twenty two. Well, I don't think that is, John. I don't think I, that's I would an actual catch twenty two. Your fear of being bad at something affecting your ability to improve at it is very much a catch twenty two, or at least a catch twenty one at a minimum. 
like it's close. Okay, yeah. Before our next podcast, I'm gonna assign you uh, a, a reading assignment of of the book Catch Twenty Two. Oh, <laughs> it's very funny. I mean, like humor, right? It's like part of me is like really wants to read it, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, John. I think that as a humor enthusiast, that you should uh, you should enjoy it. <laughs> um, anyway, to, to to sort of circle <laughs> back to training stuff, um, and we think about what we should actually do to try to improve uh, capacity and muscle endurance, right? That again, that's gonna that's gonna depend on um, where an athlete sits as far as what what their true limiting factor is. So. Um, like I mentioned before, there's some people for whom, uh, they, they, they're sort of lacking the strength to do the movements that they want to do, uh, within a conditioning style workout, right? Something that might show up in the open. So they may have a few muscle ups or they may be able to do muscle ups, uh, when they're fresh, but they can't do it under fatigue. Um, or, you know, their, their one rep max squat clean might not be quite up to par to do, um, something that's going to show up, uh, potentially as like a, an escalating barbell workout. And for those people, you know, like we talked about before, they may need to do significant amounts of muscle endurance training um, in order to build a base of support to do the more dynamic training that they want to do, right? So um, they may need to dedicate a block to uh, stuff that that seems maybe not like CrossFit as much, but you know, doing uh, high repetition band work, high repetition dumbbell work, short rest between these movements, um, something that might look more like a, a bodybuilding uh, type of situation, or like Marcus Filly's functional bodybuilding stuff, um, and that that can be a great way to to actually build up the muscle endurance to train uh, in something that looks more like CrossFit. But then we also have this group for whom. They do have the strength to do, um, you know, handstand push-ups, or they do have the strength to do a, a significant number of unbroken muscle-ups or heavy squat cleans. But then they can't express that in a in a conditioning environment where they're fatigued, right? That they can't do, um, you know, that 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 someone may have a squat clean of well over 315 pounds, but they don't make it out of the first uh, the first round of something like 19.2. And for that individual, it's not necessarily uh, just capacity, right? They may have good capacity on uh, an assault bike. They may have good capacity on rowing. They may have, they may have good capacity on uh, like certain types of more mixed modal workouts. But when mm -hmm. it comes to doing high repetition toes to bar and repeated squat cleans, that they just fall apart on that, right? So I think that that context is, is different as far as training muscle endurance. And, you know, they may feel that their quads are blowing up uh, but for them, it's not going to be a matter of doing, you know, rear foot elevated split squats and jumping switch lunges to improve that quad muscle endurance. It's a matter of how can they express that muscle endurance in this fatigued environment. Um, and that's harder to, to figure out how to train that. Um, I think if that's something that, you know, we can get fooled by saying, oh, well, your shoulders blow up when you do, um, you know, strict handstand pushups. So we should just do a bunch of seated external rotations and band pull aparts, um, which might be helpful. But for a lot of individuals, it's more that once they start to fatigue um, and then they then they try to do these movements that that something goes wrong as far as their ability to uh, to keep that moving. And that muscle endurance fatigue then starts to, to, to flip some sort of global fatigue switch, which just makes it so they can't keep going. Um, so for those people, it's much more about creating environments where they are fatigued but are still able to do the movement right so maybe uh the individual who we talked about earlier who's very strong but struggles on squat cleans in the context of um double unders and toes to bar you know maybe we need to have them do rowing at high effort into squat cleans so that they can learn to do squat cleans under fatigue uh with something cyclical okay cool you can do that you can express that you can repeat it now let's have you do um rowing and uh i don't know box jumps right? Something that's relatively simple and then do that and then go into squat cleans. Okay. You can express that. Now let's have you do, um, rowing toes to bar, rowing double unders into squat cleans since that cyclical piece then potentially gives that type of person a break so that they can then express, um, on the squat clean, uh, in a fatigued environment with some mixed stuff, but not all mixed stuff. And then they can do that. And then maybe it's time to, to take out the rowing and see if they can then, then do, uh, toast of our double unders and squat cleans. And that doesn't mean they can't be doing other muscle endurance work, but that they don't just need to improve their muscle endurance. They need to improve their ability to do that type of work under mixed modal fatigue, which is kind of a, a, a trickier thing to figure out. Yeah. Um, and I think another thing that's worth looking into, um, in a similar fashion to, uh, weightlifting where with, with people, uh, training specifically for weightlifting, 
they very rarely are going to be taking it to a true max. You know, there's a lot of sub-maximal work, sub-maximal lifting. Um, and I think the same thing is applicable to to any kind of movements within within a competitive CrossFit area. So you look at something like gymnastics and ring muscle-ups, you know, maxing out your max on broken ring muscle-ups every week isn't necessarily going to increase your max set or increase your capacity on that. Um, but doing work at sub-maximal levels. So if you can do 10 unbroken ring muscle-ups, well, let's get multiple sets of five unbroken reps. If that feels good, let's get multiple sets of six unbroken reps. Or let's do sets of five on a shorter rest time. Um, and just sub-maximal work, but essentially a high volume across time. Um, I think some sometimes people focus on that top end number um, and don't focus on the the ability to recover between smaller sets. Yeah, which is, you know, we've talked about that a few times and that ability yeah. to recover is much more important. Um, you know, I know that we've, I think we've, we've both coached athletes who have competed at a relatively high level um, that if you looked at their max set of chest to bar pull-ups or their max set of um, strict handstand push-ups or their max set of ring muscle-ups, it would actually be um, quite bad, right? Yeah. It'd be like, whoa, that's actually that doesn't make any sense. Like that's not very good. Um, but guess what? They beat a lot of people who can do much bigger sets because they can just do it over and over again, right? They can do doubles on strict handstand pushups just forever. Um, but their max set is 10 yeah. and it's like, wait, what? This other person could do 21, uh, on broken, but they get tired very easily if they have to do it repeatedly under fatigue. Whereas this other person can do, you know, assault bike and, uh, dumbbell box step overs and double unders and then just do doubles on handstand pushups just <laughs> indefinitely and never stop. Um, so yeah. that's a totally different type of totally different type of athlete. Yeah. And that's for me personally, that's where I fall into is that short repeatable sets. The story I always like telling of when I was at regionals, <laughs> three time regional athlete, <laughs> it's no big deal. Um, there was the hundreds workout in 2013. There was that hundred wall balls, hundred chest bar, hundred, Oh yeah, and the pistols. Pistols, hundred dumbbell yeah, snatch. Yeah. Um, and I did my chest of pull ups one at a time, and I distinctly remember the announcer mentioning my name and saying, "Still doing Scolding singles." You. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but then I was like, "Check out maybe... this idiot in lane eight. <laughs> What's this loser's name?" <laughs> it was it was lane twelve, I think. It was cool. it was the outside one. I wasn't doing well. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, I mean, I was like fourth or fifth off the pull-up bar and it wasn't, I might not have been doing the sets of 10, 15 reps that the people around me were doing, but I just knowing that the, I had the capacity to recover and just do quick singles all the way through and never have to slow down, um, allowed me to, to get through a little bit quicker. And I think at the time my max set was maybe 12 and that was regular kipping. <laughs> This was a pre, this is pre butterfly days. I gotta say, <laughs> um, that's incredible. So, yeah, you know that that top end capacity isn't always a determining factor, um, especially in a, especially in gymnastic movements. I'd say. Yeah, um, and I suppose since we talked about it, we should we should touch on aerobic capacity's effect on muscle endurance as well, right? So we mm -hmm. we can sort of think about. Um, muscle endurance uh, being developed sort of independent of like mixed modal environments, which we talked about, like, you know, doing um, high repetition sets, um, short rest between them, kind of like a classic bodybuilding protocol. We can think about building aerobic capacity kind of independent of a mixed modal piece, um, you know, with cyclical intervals, um, running, rowing, biking, et cetera. And that both of these are needed as base of support um, for competitors, right? They have to have these capacities in order to, to simply tolerate the training programs that are needed uh, to be done um, in terms of, can you do this many repetitions? Can you recover between it? And can you recover for your next session? Um, but that it's not, again, it's not always as simple like we talked about before in that example of like a strong athlete who struggles on something with um, uh, like 19.2, that, you know, j just having them do assault bike intervals um, may not be the path for them actually improving their ability to, to express muscle endurance and capacity in a mixed modal piece. So, um, I don't know. I think, I think it, again, it's somewhat tricky where you, where you need to have these aerobic capacity pieces as part of a training program. And it's a great way to add volume, but it's not necessarily the thing 
that's going to make someone good at doing uh, mixed pieces where they have to move from one exercise to another. Right, right. Um, and I think uh, the the effect of um, aerobic capacity on recovery um, is probably pretty important as well. Um, you know, how efficient are you at, you know, pumping blood through the body, getting oxygen to your muscles, that kind of thing. Um, so being able to have a sustained effort over a long duration, um, will also then have a, an impact on the muscular endurance side for, for athletes. Um, you know, a marathon runner is able to, or a high level marathon runner is able to constantly, um, essentially recover continuously through a run. Um, they're never hitting that uh, muscular fatigue. And it's not just the fact that they do a lot of long training runs that impacts their muscular endurance, um, but it's their um, aerobic capacity that then affects the ability to recover mid-workout. Yeah, and especially That's... in a, like a mixed piece, like that ability to recover mid-workout is so important, right? To, like yeah. we talked about a second ago, you know, the, the person who can recover um, in three to five seconds when they're transitioning off of um, an erg onto a barbell, you know, that person is going to have a huge advantage because they their their recovery is so fast uh, that compare that to someone who might not be as good um, or as talented, right? That, that 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 person would get the same amount of recovery in forty five seconds of rest uh, as someone who might get that that recovery in literally five seconds of rest, the time it takes themselves to, to unstrap and, um, stand themselves up and walk over and get set up. Like that they've actually, they've actually fully recovered. Right. And um, that's something that, you know, yeah, that, that you can train that. Uh, but it's not just, it's not just building aerobic capacity through running and rowing. Um, it's translating that aerobic capacity into the more complicated, you know, physiological mess that's happening in like a mixed modal environment. Right. Um, <clears throat> and one thing I like to, to recommend to people mid workout, which kind of plays into that, um, is avoiding resting between movements. Um, so let's take, let's continue with that. Um, toe to bar, double under squat, clean workout from the open. Um, people who take a long rest after their last squat clean before their toes to bar are kind of missing out on on a potential, uh, let's say assistance to their muscular endurance. Um, so the limiting factor on the toes to bar for most people is going to be either grip or abs. Um, on the cleans, both of those are limited. They're not completely, uh, uninvolved, but they're limited. Um, and really people trying to catch their breath after the cleans, I always recommend trying to get right up onto the bar to get your first set of toes to bar out of the way. Then if you need to take a slightly longer rest to allow your breathing to recover, um, you're also allowing your muscular endurance um, to recover a little bit as well. Um, so all of a sudden you've gone from, I have 25 toes to bar to do, to I have 20 toes to bar to do, but you've taken the same amount of rest as you would have. Um, you're just resting after that first set of toes to bar as opposed to before. Yeah, and there's something too that I don't totally understand, but if you're keeping moving, um, the fatigue signals can be sort of dull, right? That it, like it doesn't feel as bad when you're moving, but when you stop, uh, you can get like a wave of very bad feelings. So, right. and that, and that can then compound because you're like, uh Oh, I'm in trouble. I feel very bad. I should take a longer break because I feel worse than I expected to. Um, but if you, if you just figure out how to keep moving, um, that, that can, that can sort of dull that, that sense of like, uh Oh, I'm, really tired and that's the same as drinking as far as i'm aware <laughs> if you stop drinking that's when it really kicks in if you just keep pounding through that's how you really kind of avoid um feeling drunk um and then just like when you stop a workout at the end that's when all of a sudden it hits you stop drinking that's when it hits you there we go words of oh. wisdom <laughs> okay but it, it, that it, that is actually true for eating as well um, I, there you go all these, all these addictive behaviors, <laughs> drinking, eating, Working doing out. CrossFit. <laughs> <laughs> That's why if you've got a lot of food, always go for it fast. Don't go slow because you won't have room to eat it all. 
got to push through. Thanks for listening. While you're here, go ahead and head over to your podcast player, subscribe to the show, give it a rating, give it a review, all that good stuff. You can also go ahead and click through to the show notes where you can find out more about us at legionsc.com and also follow us on Instagram at legion.sc.